Thanks for tuning in to another telecast. Before this week's show, I wanted to remind you to sign up for our free weekly newsletter, Telecast Plus. It features interesting TV industry news stories from a different angle and exclusive content, such as Opinion and The Secret Producer, our anonymous TV exec reporting from the front line of TV production. Plus, we're bumping up the goodies with more free downloads of TV industry reports, discounts, and exclusive access to some live telecast events we're planning for the months ahead. And you'll only get access to those if you're on our mailing list. And don't worry, we don't like spam either, so we won't do anything weird with your data like sell it to advertisers or anything. Just sign up at our website by searching Telecast on Google or visiting telecast podcast. Dot com. Thanks a lot. Telecast, the TV industry news review. On this week's show, I'm chatting with Adam G, commissioning editor, creative producer, and co founder of Smart, the London International Smartphone Film Festival. And there's a new SVOD challenger on the block as Stroom begins rolling out its Audible-style credits model for specialist streaming services. Global Head of Content Partnerships and Distribution, Kerry Ball, gives us the lowdown. It's all coming up on this week's Telecast. This week, I'm chatting to two guests involved in pushing new boundaries and opportunities in the content industry. Welcome to Telecast, Adam G and Kerry Ball. Great to be with you. Hello. Welcome to the show, guys. Great to have you on. Adam, coming to you first. Now, we've touched on short-form content before on Telecast, but not for a little while. And and I know this is an area where you've got loads of experience. Tell us a little bit about what you're working on right now. Well, uh, this morning I'm still working on my hangover because... uh... Uh We won uh, the BAFTA, the TV BAFTA for a short program uh, in the the BAFTA awards the other night. And um, I have somewhat overdone it. So congratulations. That's fantastic. (laughs) Tell us about that. What what award was that? And and what was the show? So um, it's one of the um, TV awards that went out on Sunday night. Um, It's for short program. And it was for a film called They Saw the Sun First, uh, which is a really unusual documentary that looks at intergenerational relationships. And it uses dance, but it's not a uh, documentary about dance. It's a documentary through dance. Difficult to describe. Best thing is for people to go and have a look. Um, So you can find it on Vimeo. They Saw the Sun First. It's only eight minutes. uh, And I guarantee it will lift your day a bit. All right. So. so yeah, so that's that sort of uh, accounts for uh, the inability to string a sentence together at the moment. <laughs> well, you're doing um, you're doing pretty well so far. So uh, we'll uh, we'll make sure that we include a link to we saw the sun first in the episode description, so yeah. so everyone can go and uh, check that out. Lovely. Bit. And you're also a founder of Smart, the London International Smartphone Film Festival which is something that really caught my eye the other day. Tell us a bit about that. Well, it has similar kind of uh, starting point because two years ago, uh, together with my uh, partner in uh, Smart, uh, Victoria Mapplebeck, we made a short film on an iPhone X, which won the same BAFTA, the short programme category, um, year before last. And that was quite a kind of landmark in our eyes, just in the sense, you know, for smartphone filmmaking, because it was um, the first smartphone film to win any kind of Academy Award. And it was also the first film made predominantly for YouTube to win any kind of Academy Award. Um, mm-hmm. And so it felt like a bit of a coming of age. And then we, co- we contemplated various plans, one of which was the Smartphone Film Festival, and we just decided to go for it this spring. And we've done it very quickly because we wanted it to um, take place before the summer, largely because a lot of the smartphone films that have been made in the last year, and there have been a lot of them for obvious reasons, 
mm. uh, are about lockdown and COVID and so forth. And our feeling was that by the autumn, everyone would be heartily sick of all that and will want to move on. So this is a sort of a, a, a more optimum time to um, to celebrate these films. Um, and of course, you know, when it when it comes to our second year, we'll be on to a very different world and a very different um, uh, set of subject matter. But um, that's kind of why we've done it pretty quickly. So we've we've closed to entries last week. We had 130 entries, which I think is pretty good for an inaugural year. Very high quality. They range from fully fledged movies down to one minute TikToks and all things in between. And we've just done the first round of judging and just super impressed by the quality of what's come in. And it's come in from all over the world, from Venezuela to uh, Taiwan, from Germany to, um, <laughs> trying to think of other countries, um, Canada. Um, yeah, there are a lot of countries I could choose from. Uh, and and even Slough, all, th- all, all things in those points. It's, it is very international, but obviously the bulk uh, is from the UK. Uh, it's just gone out to our six juries yesterday. We've got some amazing jurors from kind of starry, uh, well-known names. So we've got um, Adrian Dunbar from Line of Duty and Alex Lawther from End of the Effing World on Channel 4 through to really kind of veteran documentary makers like Brian Hill and uh, really a fantastic mix of people with a fantastic range of skills to help um, judge the entries. And then um, next week we will be announcing the nominations and then on the 21st we start the festival itself, which is basically... Uh, one event for each of the six categories, uh, highlighting the winners and the runners-up. And then alongside those each night, um, a different uh, sort of 45-minute event uh, showcasing a practitioner. So uh, we open with a woman called Jennifer Zhang, who's made um, movies on smartphones. Um, We have Brian Hill on the second night, who's just made a... um, a film with our, our poet laureate Simon Armitage um, about um, what the last year has been like for the country. Um, and then on the third night, we've got a guy called um, uh, Kevin. Oh God, I'm going to forget his name. I'm not going to worry about it. Anyway, he makes amazing TikTok films. He's, he's actually not super young. He's um, uh, he's not your sort of typical TikToker, but he makes really good um uh, TikTok films. Um, Ke- Kevin, apologies in advance. I uh, honestly, I've lost a lot of brain cells. I'm not kidding. Okay, yeah, okay. Well, we can all we can all forgive you that, uh, <laughs> yeah. Adam. Looking at the categories, mm. so we've got one minute or under. Yeah, we've got drama scripted ten minutes or under. Yeah, uh, documentary factual ten minutes or under. Drama scripted over ten minutes. Documentary factual over ten minutes, and then experimental another. So yeah. it really covers a lot of ground, doesn't it? By its nature, it covers everything because basically it's just dividing things into scripted or unscripted and then different lengths of time uh, where 10 minutes is the sort of border between short and long. Um, And then because it's got an experimental and other category, anything that doesn't fit into those others will fit into there. So everything is covered, basically. Right. And what's going to be really interesting, I think, is it's almost going to be a bit of a, a time capsule, I'm expecting to see when these come in, because as you say, they were all filmed in lockdown they don't necessarily need to be lockdown themed presumably but no the I mean, subject it, matter will probably lend itself as you as you say to to that well it's just you know obviously it's the period that uh, these have been made in but um uh first of all anyway we extended our el- eligibility period prior to last year because it's our inaugural year so we wanted to sweep up some of the really good stuff that's been made in the year or two before so not everything is about lockdown in the festival but a lot of them are uh, and they're in uh, really interesting circumstances. You know, there's stuff from China, from these kind of quarantine hotels, which are real kind of insights. There's stuff from Stuttgart, uh, interesting film that looks at, you know, what it's done to employability at the sort of lower end of the job market, um, the more casual end of the job market. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so there's a lot of stuff covered. A lot of it is much more kind of personal and um family-oriented stories. Um, Some of it is insights into um, 
the role of healthcare workers but there's there's kind of a bit of everything and some of it is just fun and um um uh really not taking itself too seriously so there, there's quite a lot of nice sort of scripted comedy that is just nice and kind of inventive and sort of making light of the difficulties of the production context and in terms of the entries that you've seen so far without probably naming any obviously as yeah. you're going through the the uh the the judging process but would you say that any of these are broadcastable pretty much all of them um because you you know you have to realize that smartphones have come on a great deal so issues there are no issues of um of of picture or sound with smartphones anymore i mean they're like 4k picture um audio is great and the and the kind of audio accessibility accessories are are, are very cheap and easy to get your hands on so <clears throat> it's just a non-issue uh and there's for example, there's a terrific documentary that's come in from Iran. Oh, yeah, there's another country I forgot, but that was one of the more exotic ones. Um, mm. But it's, you know, it's it's as beautiful cinematography as you'd ever see um, and a terrific story. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's more than broadcastable. Puts a lot of broadcast to shame, you know. Those sort of hierarchies are probably kind of... Um, I don't know, they're a kind of distraction or an irrelevance, really. So, you know, when you look at it across the board, um, there's been a number of feature films and movies that have been made on smartphones. I wouldn't say it's kind of mainstream, but you've got names like um, Steven Soderbergh, Sean Baker in Europe, Claude Lelouch. You know, there's a number of, uh, you know, Michel Gondry. There's a number of uh, well-known directors that have turned to the smartphone some with huge enthusiasm, of which, um, you know, Steven Soderbergh is probably top of the list because he's always been a sort of video and gadget guy from the beginning of his career. And then uh, in television, uh, we've had interesting commissions during the lockdown from streamers, for example. Netflix did a great series called Homemade, which uh, was substantially shot on smartphones uh, by people like Kristen Stewart and Gurinder Chadha. Then we've had very interesting developments in television around smartphones. So there are new technologies that have been deployed substantially for the first time during lockdown. So, for example, Shine TV did um, a series called A Very British Lockdown using smartphones and a sort of tech, a sort of very easy to get your hands on and reasonably priced technical infrastructure, which basically does away with the um, with the satellite truck and means you can kind of broadcast out of people's homes, directing and shaping the, the program remotely. And so that's a real development. It's a bit like if you think about what um, drones did to helicopter shots, i.e. made them redundant and, and ridiculously expensive overnight. That's what this does to satellite trucks, really, to a large extent. So it, we're not going to go backwards on this because it, it makes more sense and it's cheaper more cost effective and um and just as good a quality of um uh, image being broadcast but what it meant for shine in this particular show was that they could direct contributors remotely and and therefore have stuff contributor shot that's well framed well thought through captures the right stuff pointing at the right thing at the right time so that's tv but actually really the interesting stuff is is happening on mobile oriented platforms like TikTok, which is why we had that one minute category, um, because we wanted to connect with that place where the most fresh and interesting and innovative uh, filmmaking is actually happening. The kind of the movie stuff is something of a distraction. The TV stuff is really quite interesting, um, but perhaps it's sort of subtle and of interest to the industry uh, more than the viewer in terms of how productions are made. But the, the sort of really interesting stuff is, is really in these digital platforms where uh, younger generations in particular, but not exclusively, are just making amazing stuff that's different and fresh and feels uh, intimately linked to the, to the smartphone. And presumably the quality of productions that you're seeing coming through, you know, really helps unearth some you know quite remarkable new talent when it comes to directors or when it comes to or well, presumably most of those submitting entries are shooting directors you know they're just one person bands if you like they're individuals that are creating their films 
Certainly a lot of them are, and there's a good number of first-time filmmakers uh, included as well, which is great, because it's intimately linked uh, with this big subject of our age, which is sort of diversity and access. But it obviously is a major contribution to that, because pretty much all of us have got a smartphone that's capable of producing really high-quality video. We can get the software very reasonably, and it's not even essential, but there's software that helps um, give you more control over the camera in your phone. And then obviously everyone has access to the distribution as well. So what that kind of translates to is that the things that ultimately really matter are talent and uh, and vision. And really, that's all that ultimately matters, that, that, that everyone's on the level playing field around those two key areas. It's very much part of the concept of SMART that it, it helps when it comes to diversity of all kinds. And I don't just mean uh, ethnicity and race uh, or gender, but uh, all the other aspects of diversity as well. So um, stuff around kind of neurodiversity, other capabilities, uh, mental health, all these things. Um, and I suppose maybe above all, the whole question of kind of socioeconomic background are really important and are a little bit overshadowed by the big things on the landscape. But ultimately, that's actually probably where we can make kind of most impact and 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 it's sort of still somewhat neglected so it's a big part of our agenda to catalyze the access of more different people to the industry so we get more different fresher more innovative stories and coming back to what you said earlier on about uh i mean walking around with a relatively new iPhone, which I've got in my pocket. And I'm sure when I see these entries, I'll be shamefully looking at my own short videos that I put together. I mean, in terms of what you need in terms of apps and in terms of sound and light equipment, as you say, it's it's pretty accessible, isn't it? You don't need to spend thousands of pounds on all of these other accessories. And, And I would imagine some of your entrants have literally just using the bare phone and that's pretty much it yeah i mean you you don't need anything extra and you don't even need you know you don't need the most up-to-date phone either but you know there are some benefits so as i say um filmic pro is probably the preeminent app it gives you more control over your phone which means that you can sort of uh, mix up the uh pictures a bit more different depths of field and so forth and just generally have more control. Obviously, audio is always critical. And so getting kind of external mics and stuff, that is not expensive and it's a worthwhile investment, but it's not essential. Uh, you know, the stability of the phones is is much improved, but uh, there are very cheap kind of gimbal type um, stabilizers, which are kind of worth um, getting and using for some stuff. So none of it's expensive and none of it's essential. Right, okay. Uh, there are times when you want to ditch it anyway, because... One of the benefits of smartphones, um, apart from the fact that it's on you all the time, is that it's um, it's kind of unintimidating and it's really familiar. So there are times when you just want to look like an amateur but behave like a professional. In other words, you ditch your gimbal and your your mics and you you just shoot like any uh, Joe or Josephine on the street, um, and you can exploit a kind of intimacy and a kind of gray area um which you can't with any other uh, sort of form of filmmaking so the bottom line is there are certain things that, that you can film on smartphones that you can't really film in any other way um and that's usually to do with a degree of kind of intimacy and the subjects being um relaxed or sometimes it's to do with access to spaces that you can't normally Uh, traipse into with a film crew where do we go to actually see any of the submitted films the kind of core of operations is the website which is at smartfilmfest.net and you can access most things through there and most information through there and then uh, there'll also be details of the um, program so you can come see the best of the crop uh, in the week of 21st to 25th of june when we'll be um, showing each category one by one across the five nights. We'll also really kind of do our best to amplify what has come in in the wake of the festival as well. And part of the um, prize for winners is uh, an opportunity to get distribution through Little Dot Studios, uh, through their Real Stories channel. 
um, and some of their other channels. So um, Little Dot are an amazing outfit. Um, they publish five and a half billion, that's billion with a B, views worth of video every month. So they're on a very grand scale. So the opportunity to get distribution through through Little Dot, which is part of all three media, is an amazing opportunity. Uh, they also, apart from a kind of gong, they also get um, uh, some mentoring from some of the amazing people that are involved um, judging and, uh, and generally with the festival. So uh, that will also be something worth, um, you know, worth getting. Definitely. Well, we'll also feature the winner on the Telecast Plus newsletter, which goes out every Friday. So we'll put links to that. So uh, lots of our industry subscribers can go and take a look at that. That'd be brilliant. Yeah. And uh, so in, in terms of where smartphone filmmaking goes from here, I mean, obviously, you know, we've most of us got 4K filmmaking capabilities in our pocket. With the next generation of smartphones, what will that enable us to do? And how do you think smartphone filmmaking can develop from here? I think the sort of bottom line really is that it just deserves its place on the uh, playing field of mainstream production right now. You know, we don't have to wait for the next generation because the uh, certainly in terms of technical quality, that's already here. So it, it it doesn't mean that things like uh, kind of honing the craft uh, changes in any way. Like there's nothing about smartphone filmmaking that means you need any less training or any less um, honing of your, uh, you, you know, of your abilities and, and, and of the craft itself. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a completely mainstream type of filmmaking, which enables you to film certain things and should be one of the sort of key tools of mainstream production. So I think that's the bottom line of it, really. We, we all should keep an eye on, on that kind of amazing energy that, that we see around us, especially on sort of digital platforms of just new and different ways of telling stories and making films. You know, in, in lots of cases, you have to wade through an awful lot of crap to get to the nuggets. Mm. Nonetheless, you know, the nuggets are there and they, they point in some interesting kind of creative directions. Um, I suppose also, even though the film festival is, uh, as I say, it sort of pretty much covers every, every genre and every length. I'm a big advocate of short films because I think telly is outside of drama, which is its own kind of little bubble in a way. But especially factual TV, which I worked in, you know, for 13 years at Channel 4, telly is pretty kind of flabby in the mainstream these days and it's difficult to watch sometimes and the more time you spend making short films the more intolerant you get of how slow the storytelling is and how repetitious and how formatted and formulaic it is and kind of dull and moribund um I do think there's you know there's a lot of potential and of uh, mileage in smartphone filmmakings and it's where a lot of the real Art of, of our industry is. I, I, I suppose he could draw the parallel with David Hockney having adopted the iPad as something that he could work in as a as a world renowned artist, and now he displays a lot of his iPad work. Right, so in a way yeah. that this is actually a similar parallel when it comes to the moving image and technology enabling anybody and democratizing the filmmaking process, really. The Hockney um, example is um, is a slightly tricky one because I mean some people are, are sort of dubious about the quality of what he's produced on on those machines, but it's sort of missing the point in a way because he's been an experimenter all the way through his career. I mean he experimented with Polaroid photos to great effect um, in the seventies, and um, I, this this is a long time ago and probably uh, forgotten in the midst of time. But he did a great program called Painting with Light where he used Quantel Harry, I think it was, or Paint, no, it was Paintbox, I think. Um, but, it, you know, he used an early um, uh, TV uh, graphics machine to uh, have a go at making art on. So he's been doing it for long before the iPad was a, a glimmer in the eye of its um, creator. Um, but he is a sort of, he's open and he, he's open to new tools. And I guess that's, a, mm-hmm. that's also, you know, that's very much what the smartphone thing's about. Well, we'll put a link to Smart, the London International Smartphone Film Festival in the episode description so you can all go and have a check out and see what, uh, see what you can see up there. But it uh, sounds fascinating. 
Lovely, thanks. Kerry, welcome to Telecast. Great to have you on the show. Now, today, streaming is dominated by the big subscription services like Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime Video, Apple TV. We all know these behemoths that are going and swallowing each other up. And uh, together, according to Nielsen, they have about a 75% share of the streaming market. Now, we've also seen an explosion in other more niche SVOD services over the past few years. Now, you're global head of content partnerships and distribution at Stroom. Now, for those who haven't heard about the company, can you tell us a little bit about Stroom? Because it's 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 a very new business, isn't it? Yes, it is, and uh, the the whole Stroom concept has deli- has developed incredibly quickly um, from conception to launch. Uh, the four founders that are behind it, Lauren De Villier, Paul Pastor, Eugene Liu, and Thomas Wadsworth, uh, all worked across Disney together. Lauren, Eugene, and Thomas across um, Disney Plus and its forerunner Disney Life. Um, and Paul was part of the initial team of Hulu, on Hulu from the ABC side. Um, and they each bring very deep uh, knowledge in their areas. So Thomas it comes from uh, Disney Imagineering. Uh, Eugene owned you know, a good portion of the stack uh, at Disney Plus. Uh, Paul, I've already talked about. Uh, and Lauren is, you know, amazing at that product management and and idea conception. Um, And Lauren had really come up with it uh, based on sort of her addiction to class bars, which we'll talk about later. But, um, and they they then went out for funding. I talked to them, talked to Paul very early on from the right side um, and the distribution side um, and thought it was a fascinating idea, but, they took it out to VCs. They very quickly uh, managed to get Michael Eisner and Andy Redman from the Tornanta company to take most of the seed round. Um, and notable investors also like Kevin Mayer and Elaine Paul. So, uh, and it has a, a particularly strong uh, board as well with Nancy Tellum and Donald Hicks uh, and Ben Pine. So it was a great team for me to get involved with. I've always been fascinated with um, new services i've my entire career has been about launching uh, new distribution platforms and new models from early days at nbc when we watched dto and it took eight hours to download a movie um to the first roku channel oh, sorry one of the first Roku channels which i now when i was at shine um and then later you know working through the a lot of the discovery digital product from the international side and getting distribution and, and, and uh, out into the market. So it, it's it's a great team. It's a very deep team. Um, everybody brings uh, both a, a deep knowledge of their um, area um, and their piece of expertise. And we all know each other pretty well. I worked with Paul and Lauren when I was at Discovery because they they also worked there. Um, As I say, all the rest of the founders had worked together when they were at Disney. And so Stroom is a new breed of streaming service with a mission to really streamline streaming for all of those outside the the big guys. Uh, For a monthly fee, you receive uh, a number of credits which you can use on a central platform across a wider range of streaming services. Uh, They specialize uh, in many different genres and many focuses, uh, have a deep uh, content lineup in those verticals. Um, And the app lets you enjoy and discover, um, use your credits across these services, but it also lets you see which services you're using a lot, which services you value, and then you can add that uh, service as a managed service at the post using the credit model. Okay, so for example, I'm watching History Hit and I'm watching Insight TV and I'm watching Indie Flicks and I'm sort of just looking at various shows that each of they have got. And then I decide I want to subscribe and go further. It's like, actually, you know, now I've tried them, I actually would like to to subscribe. So, so I subscribe, for example, for Insight TV through the Stroom platform, essentially, and then I would access it via that? Indeed. So the credit system allows you 
to dip in and out, try services, understand what services, get under the hood really of what's in there and how that works for you. Um, We took a very expensive decision at the beginning of the process to ingest 100% on our platform. Um, And the reason we did that is we can then see what people are going to watch. We can allow, we can create different cohorts of users. So the recommendation engine and the discovery will, on one side, suggest content that is suggested to like-minded viewers as yourself. Um, It also allows us to go one step further because it, it essentially allows our services to stand side by side each other to un, to to widen that funnel and find new consumers that they may have had a lot of difficulty reaching out to directly. These are the second uh, adopters, the tertiary adopters that are very costly when you run a vertical uh, subscription service to find. Uh, but by creating these different cohorts of users, by suggesting uh, con similar content or like-minded content, uh, we we can help them uh, widen that funnel. And that's the key, isn't it? It's about discovery and aggregation. And that's where we're going. And we've heard a lot of that from various analysts and reports that we've seen and the, the direction of travel and, and billing relationships are also in incredibly important when it comes to SVODs. Yes. I mean, we built Stroom on three on three tenants, access, discovery, and value. And we see ourselves very much as a complement to our partners and our service providers. Uh, we lean heavily in the service into brands and services, becoming the signpost for the content as well as the brand within the service. Um, the more consumer enablement, the more engagement we can drive, uh, the, the more people that will come to the platform and sign up um, within each of our services uh, to both their SVOD or enjoy the content. I mean, in today's landscape, you know, people are already cherry picking content. Free trials are essential, but a bit of a frenemy because people will see the content. Consumers are increasingly savvy on how they deal with SVOD services. Um, Either there's a bill shock scenario where they don't sign up because they're scared of forgetting about it and finding that that subscription in a few months' time, or they're just really savvy and they know how to operate in the free trial. Or even if there's not a free trial, they just look for that piece of content. So it's very difficult to then widen the net. In this world, if a consumer is coming into your service to cherry pick, one, you get paid from a service provider, you get paid from that side. Um, But also it allows the consumers to see more and more of your content and create that value dynamic in the consumer's brain that actually this is a service that it's worthwhile me subscribing to and saving my credits to discover a range of other services. How many different services have you have you got on Stroom so far? Um, we have uh, 59 services signed up to date. Uh, we launched a couple of weeks ago uh, with around 25 of those services. You can imagine getting all of those assets on the platform takes a little bit of time, but it, you know we are already um, nearing 10,000 assets. We have 44,000 assets um, signed up already and more to come. Um, so we... We are, you know, charging ahead, really. The services span some all sorts of genres. And that is the point. The point is to be able to enable discovery and see the people who may enjoy action sports and motorsports or um, history and natural natural history, history, geography, uh, travel, um, and be able to create all of those different ways into the service. Um, We have people from uh, people like BBC Selects, uh, so bringing people from uh, other parts of the world uh, into into the US, and we will be doing the same as we launch internationally um, the other way around. For a consumer, you're hoping that Stroom will sit alongside as the fourth or fifth service to Netflix, Disney Plus and Amazon, for example, it will sit there essentially as a gateway to all of these other niche services. 
when it comes to app distribution, will we be seeing Stroom on Samsung TVs, for example? You know, will it be in our living room as opposed to just on our iPad? So what, what's what's the distribution strategy for the app? We have huge ambitions, as you can imagine. Mm. And certainly with our backers, that you know, that that is the very essence of the whole service. You're right in saying, what do we see ourselves in? You know, we see ourselves as that next generation. Right now, you're you choose your streaming services, and once you've probably choose your first top three, then you're in this huge world of over 300 services in the US alone right now. And so we see ourselves as being a number four, a number five. I mean, it, it's fascinating that only a couple of years ago, people were talking about subscriber fatigue uh, hitting in at about 4.8 subscription. Uh, before, only a couple of years before that, the number of three was banded around. We're already seeing, a, you know, 50%, nearly 50% of US households who have four or more subscriptions. Our aim is to be that fourth, that fourth platform where for a monthly fee, you can get access to all of these platforms and then you can manage them centrally through the Stream subscription. So it's going to be a choice between Stroom and Warner Brothers Discovery, I guess, when it comes to that fourth service. Uh, maybe. Who knows? But, uh, I mean, it doesn't – there's a lot to evolve in the streaming landscape at this point in time. People are going to have different preferences. Uh, and as they juggle of do they have Netflix, Amazon, you know, and Warner's Discovery – there's still then a, a, a fourth place. They may have four and then there's a fifth place. So I, I don't see it as going head to head. What we're doing is really bringing, creating a, uh, a balanced landscape for everyone else to come onto the platform and enjoy discovery through us as another choice in the consumer's portfolio of products. A couple of weeks ago, you've launched. So the service is now available in the US. Is it is it only in the US right now or is it available worldwide? Um, the service is only available in the US right now. It will indeed be everywhere. We have a commercial launch um, in the July period where we will be available on iOS, Chromecast, web and Android. We are then working on our 10 foot experiences across all different smart TVs. Um, and OTT platforms as we speak. So the idea will be by the autumn, certainly by winter, will be available on all those major platforms. And then at that point, presumably, then it's a case of, right, you need to go and tell consumers that Stroom is out there. Yes, yes, indeed. And there's some really interesting and unusual um, advantages that the credit model has, especially when you're doing distribution uh, deals. It, Usually when people do bundle models with telcos, et cetera, um, you're looking at bundling monthly subscriptions because that works with the way that a mobile bill is, is issued, et cetera. Mm. The great thing about the credit model is there are, it sort of democratizes some of that distribution as well because you can still do that. But you can also talk for, about marketing distribution deals where – you know, you're bundling a certain amount of credits with a product of which, you know, that enables you to go to lower price products to be able to uh, open that net and get more people to see the platform. So we will be working through distribution, the, the sort of traditional, if you like, distribution deals. But there's a whole host of new ways we can reach the consumer, uh, which works both for us and our marketing distribution partners. But what's the profile of an ideal content service partner for Stroom? The, the wonderful thing about Stroom, actually, is there's not one ideal service, uh, service partner. The fact is, we only succeed if our service providers um, succeed. And to do that, we need to create breadth and depth at the same time. So you may have some services that are more, that are broader. Uh, around a particular demographic, or you may have services that are deeper um, around one particular genre. And for us, what we need to do is, is bring all of those services together, because by doing that, it becomes a data play. It becomes, we really understand how we can create 
these different cohorts of consumers and then maximize uh, the, the presentation of those service providers to uh, our users. The users see more content that they, they wouldn't have found directly. Um, but because of, of uh, shows that they've watched within their um, portfolio and within that they've exchanged credits for, uh, we can then start sort of lifting services up that may never have been found. So I don't think we have an ideal profile. I think, like everything, though, strong content, um, a particularly uh, loyal fan base, and then an additional fan base. Because, you know, the, the loyal fan, if you are um, Echo Boom Sports or Fuel TV, two, two of the platforms on our service, you, you will be able to market to your first adopters and get them onto the platform. The people that are much harder to find are the people who quite like um, some of those action sports, who quite like snowboarding or quite like, and it isn't until they've been able to discover that and those services be raised um, to the consumer's usage that they're going to know. So if I've just set up my, I don't know, let's say it's an anime SVOD, Let's say and there's a few of those, a few of them out there. I realise. Uh, let, let's say I have a very specific type of anime. Do I need to be a certain size? Do I need to have a certain number of subscribers already to enter the conversation with Stroom? If I'm just literally launching and I want to scale as fast as possible, I'm obviously going through my core audience and trying to convert them. Mm -hmm. Do I need to get a, to a certain size before Stroom will are interested in partnering? Or are you just happy to speak to anybody? Obviously, content is king, right? And uh, depth of content is king. So I think, you know, we look at services that have quality content um, and that reach out to a demo or a genre um, that we believe uh, will be strong in the platform. Uh, we have how new they are or, or, you know, how long in the tooth they are um, is not really irrelevant. It's what is under the hood and what, um, how does it sit within our current uh, grouping of services? Stroom could get, uh, you know, we we could and we are approached a lot um, across many many SVODs. So it could become um, the the one destination for everyone else. Um, but we will initially at this point we are looking at making sure that we represent every genre and we're deep in every genre and that there is a loyal. Uh, there is a loyal base for those sort of product. It might not be the actual service, but for that um, for, for that avenue. So when I'm looking at the carousel, so I, I, I open up Stroom and I look lots of different streaming services on there. You know, who gets on the carousel? What about the preference of placement on the carousel? Because presumably there are there are premium slots on there. How how does how does that work? We've structured the service um, with regards to partnerships and marketing from two sides. There's the editorial element, so there are hero images. The interface is beautifully um, slick, and as I said before, we we use each of those brands have a reel that have a, a brand placement on that reel, and as you enter those brands, you end up in a walled garden of all of the content from those services. So you can quickly see the brand, click on your brands. It's all horizontally scrollable, vertically scrollable, and be able to enter that brand and, and see it straight away. Um, but there's also the algorithmic side, which is important, particularly when you're talking about you know widening the funnel. Um, and so the, the, the data play and the algorithm is also connecting uh, these different consumers who may not have been connected in different ways, but are through their watching profile. Um, we are working, we, we've taken a very, you know, very heavy lean into our brands. Um, and therefore, we, will, we are ensuring that, and 
the second hire after me actually was a guy called Ali Upham who used to run editorial um, in the Apple UK store and also in the Discovery Plus store, Plus, uh, Plus store in the UK. Um, and he's very adept at ensuring that across the portfolio, all our brands get served up in terms of the editorial side uh, and then the algorithmic. So it's a, it's a dual approach to make sure that content is being discovered based on what you watch and then also adding something new based on calendar, based on the uh, editorial calendar of each and every one of our services. So we're working through that with all of our partners. There's also many different front doors into the content or service within the app. So you can look at things by genre, or you can look at them by brand, you can look at them um, by whatever's trending, or whatever's up next. Um, you can look at it by type of content, whether it's TV, movie, shorts. Um, so there are, in each different screen, that's, there is uh, a, a, the same structure. Um, but it brings up new services and new content all of the time. And just so so that everyone's really clear, when you open Stroom, it, it's a very familiar carousel. And essentially, you're not looking at a, a host of services. You're actually looking at content. You're looking at, you know, uh, the latest move, Planets of the Apes. Uh, so I want to go and watch Planets of the Apes. And actually... That is the hero image as opposed to obviously the service that it's hosted on is is a much smaller logo within that actual uh, visual interface. Yes, I mean, that's right. And we have lent into, you know, a very intuitive, the way when we're not trying to reinvent the wheel that people um, scroll on uh, subscription devices. However, what I would say is every piece of content is tied to the service and the brand. And when you go into that content, you come to a page which will have the brand on top and then a reel of all other content. So it's very, very important to us that the content and the brand go hand in hand. You're not just seeing uh, the, the artwork. You're seeing the artwork underscored by the service it's from. Even when you go to playback, you know, the, there is a, a three second bumper, which will have the name and the brand of that service. So you you still know you are in that service and watching content from that service. And we never delineate a brand and a service. Okay. One last question. So when it comes to discoverability, because we know this is so important, even for all the major SBODs and how much of a uh, focus they put on uh, discoverability of individual titles within within their uh, carousels, et cetera. If I'm an SBOD and I've got a marketing budget and it's really important for me to actually get some more subscriptions, is there an internal market when it comes to being able to place your content in a premium position? No, uh, we're, we're certainly not, you know, <laughs> right now, you know, they're all our children, if you like. Um, but one aspect maybe I, I didn't describe properly before was the credits are set by our service partners. So they say how many credits are for each piece of content. Therefore, as a content partner, um, you're using Stream to widen that funnel, but you're also seeing all the other services that are on that are on our platform. Um, we took a really holistic view of how we put the partners beside each other um, and how we we display them to the user. Uh, but from the content partner side, they are looking at, at how many credits they set against. Uh, their film, their series, their library series, their shorts, etc. What that allows uh, our partners to do is follow the distribution strategy that they're really looking for. So if you are looking at maximizing the value of the credit model, um, then there'll be one set of, of pricing uh, that will work to do that. If you are looking to funnel as many people it to be a subscriber of your service within Stroom, that will suggest another set. And we are going to, uh, actually we are, as we speak, developing tools that will give that sort of pricing, that credit allocation mechanism uh, to arm our partners at being able to um, exploit their services the way they wish. 
it's all about the data mm-hmm. and it's everybody talks about amazon as being you know prime and 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 you know delivery service they're not there it's a data company and everybody's kind of coming around to that fact now in terms of the data that you'll be generating around content is that something that you're sharing you're completely open with when it comes to the SVOD service partners that are that are part of stream well obviously we have various privacy laws we need to to stand behind um but within e service we are aiming to share as much data as we're allowed to um so it, we will have various functionality that people can opt in to services if they're if they're signing on uh, and communications from there we will be able to um we are developing uh, it, it it is you know it will be ready very shortly um a, a data dashboard that our service providers will be able to go in and see where they are see how their content's performing um so in terms of the sharing of data you know as i said the the idea is that we are complementary to all of their other um, uh, front doors into their service. Uh, And we want to be seen as an add-on to that, and that means sharing data. We've all been on the other side, and we all know how hard it is um, to persuade people inside our companies to go on a platform when you get very little data out. So we will, you know, one of the central tenets is exactly that, is enabling a structure that our partners find additional consumers, find that second and third uh, adopter and widen the funnel, um, but also manage to to understand how the content is performing on the service. And now it's time in the show for Kerry and Adam to pick their stories of the week, the TV industry news items that have caught their eye in the past seven days. Kerry, what's your story of the week? So unsurprisingly, my story of the week is very related to what I'm doing at Stream. Um, But Parks and Associates, uh, every year or so, uh, release uh, a a study talking about how many people have OTT or subscription services. In the US this week, they announced that 82% of US broadband households have at least one SVOD. And 46% have at least four OTT services. Now, what's fascinating about that is not those statistics. I think, you know, many people are aware, particularly over the pandemic, um, the boom and the increasing boom uh, within subscription uptake. But what is interesting is how that compares to even two years ago. So two years ago, that stat stood at about 64% had at least one SVOD platform. And 36% had two or more SVODs. So not only have we gone up in the percentage of multiple SVODs that we're measuring here, we've gone up in how many additional SVODs that they have. And of the 20% that are left, you know, it, it ten, you can sort of pick out. It, it's it's uh, half of those are retired. 93% of those don't have children at home. Um, uh, three quarters are over 55 plus. Uh, The big question that all leads to is churn and and subscriber acquisition costs. Um, And, you know, that's why this all feeds back into Stream, really, because what we are trying to do is create that platform where people can enjoy the content, but also create the value dynamic in in the user's psyche that this service is worth subscribing for and combating that churn argument. And obviously, we've also seen everybody turning to SVODs and AVODs as well during the pandemic. Indeed. And we're coming out of yeah. that now. So there is likely to be drop off, isn't there? And I think there's a lot of stats that we've seen, particularly for the big SVODs that, you know, Netflix might not expect the same sort of growth that it's had and the same in some other markets. And obviously, that's all going down to regional strategies adapting as as a as a point of that it's going to be an interesting next phase of the SVOD evolution if you like the landscape yeah there was another article yesterday on that point that in fierce video talking about the fact that there 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 is in the first quarter first quarter uh, this year compared to first quarter last year a drop off uh, in terms of each individual uh, service SVOD service uh, and their acquisition rates 
I think, though, it's a bigger picture than that because there's obviously, a, a, you know, a, a hump in the middle of, of there. Where we are now compared to two years ago is still a lot higher. And more than that, it's encouraging people to go beyond the original, you know, the big five or, or six SVOD players. So it it is fragmenting even more. It's also making people look at different business models. So from subscription to AVOD to this credit model, you know, it, it's making people realize there are different ways to consume the content that might match their profile better. It's going to be even more fascinating over the coming months and uh, and when you guys launch the consumers around the world as well. So we're, we're going to be uh, watching very closely and uh, all the very best of luck in your launch. Thanks very much. Adam, what's your story of the week? Mine is from uh, The Guardian, although it was in a number of different um, papers this week. Uh, headline, gambling logos feature 700 times in football match, says Channel 4 documentary. So this is about a documentary that went out last night, Monday the 7th, I think it was. <laughs> and it was looking at the role of gambling sponsorship in uh, sports and in football um, and this number is actually in, in in a sort of a typical game. A person uh, could be a young person, uh, could easily be a young person has seven hundred and sixteen uh, exposures to gambling in the match, even when there's no advertising, just from flashes of the um, kind of pitch side hoardings and so forth. Yeah. Um, and my kind of reason for picking this story is I just. I don't get why we allow gambling to be to have the sort of mainstream acceptance that it seems to have to be accepted as a norm. I, I entirely reject that. I think it's one of the worst kinds of addiction. Um, it's even worse than drink and drug addiction, really, because it's so pernicious and corrosive, toxic, uh, and there's just no joy in it. So it's almost like the opposite of sports. No, no health, no joy. <laughs> It's, yeah. it's like, it's like anti-sport. Um, and sometimes um, watching uh, Channel 4 late at night, for example, and it's not the only one, it's just depressing the amount of advertising. You know, all the advertising is for um, gambling, not not necessarily betting, but the other side of the industry, the the casinos and so forth, which is intimately related. And and in fact, the the, the football stuff is like the gateway drug to the to, to the um, casino stuff. It does remind me of actually Formula One in the 80s when it was trying to wean itself off the tobacco sponsorship. And you're right. I mean, surely the time's come now when I know there are various things that a lot of clubs do. They have junior sponsors for kids' shirts. So, you know, kids aren't walking around with, uh, with betting uh, logos on. But actually, you know, once they're 18, I suppose they... They are, but even so, that doesn't, that's not the, the point. The point is the prevalence of these gambling brands. It's just overwhelming, and I, and I think, you know, you're right. I mean, where, where are all the FMCG brands that want to uh, sponsor clubs? You know, I know that you've got certain, like Chevrolet, I know they're a major sponsor in the, in the Premier yeah. League, and there's lots of other examples, but surely they've got the budgets and the exposure that they would bring i mean I, I suspect they're kind of outbid but that's not really the point it's 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 broader than this it's about accepting gambling as a norm in society i just think that needs to be questioned because it's not a norm uh, and it's not good for individuals or society and now it's time in the show where my guests get to nominate their hero of the week and who or what they're telling to get in the bin Adam, who's your hero of the week? My hero of the week is someone called Rosie Van Oss. I've never met her, but I watched her in one of the entries to uh, Smart, to the London International Smart Film Film Festival. Um, and uh, she's in a film by a first-time filmmaker called Kitty Camilleri, who is 27. Um, and she submitted this very interesting film called One Year, which is basically uh, very simple. You just see uh, Rosie, who is an ICU um, nurse or junior doctor, um, walking around in on a rainy day in some kind of heathland, 
um, and she just tells you what the last year has been like from her point of view. And you really don't need any further pictures other than her face in the rain, which somehow just has a, you know, it just is reminiscent of tears, really. It's really atmospheric and, and it's a real insight into what it has been like for healthcare professionals during the last year. So she is my heroine of the week, both of them, Rosie and Kitty, for putting it on film with her smartphone. They're also a hero of the year, I think, uh, I can say without um, too much fear of contradiction. Yeah, absolutely. And who or what are you telling to get in the bin? What I'm telling to get in the bin is an advert that I saw um, in the window of a betting shop in our high street yesterday with um, odds on England winning the Euros. So we have a quite a short high street. Um, it's pretty kind of middle class, and yet it still has three betting shops on it. Um, so uh, at the risk of banging on uh, about a particular thing, it's it's again about this normalisation of gambling um, on TV and elsewhere. Um, and also uh, something in the poster, which was, um, like I say, it was odds on England winning, it's that rather inflated nationalistic hope that doesn't really come from a good place that gets wheeled out every time there's an international football competition. Um, but I guess bringing it back to TV, a, a thing that really annoys me. So uh, I, this could also be uh, this is a sort of a, a thing that could also go in the bin. Uh, but I, when I'm watching um, TV late at night and I see these uh ads for casinos and gambling we have this um thing from gamblerware that says um something like stop when the fun stops uh or no when the fun stops stop i think that's the slogan um but it's completely fake if you actually watch it they don't even give enough time for you to read it and it gets kind of clipped in the ad so there's no sense that any of them really believe that stuff um and we know they don't believe it um so I think um, that would go in the bin for me, both both that awful, un, unbelieved in slogan and this kind of advertising that I walked past yesterday in the street, uh, all part of this uh, normalisation of an industry that's kind of uh, substantially operated from overseas, got really patchy regulation. They don't check um, age properly. Um, so it's an all round toxic aspect of our society and I happily chuck it in the bin. All right. And that's a double bin. I think it deserved double bin there, Adam. Yeah. Du double bin. Yeah. Both bits in there. Kerry, who's your hero of the week? <laughs> so, um, I have a love of Cornwall and I think the, t the, the team at Carbis, uh, Bay Hotel and St. Ives just winning the fact that they've managed to get the entire G7, uh, through their doors, um, as well as the sun that they're getting to show Cornwall in its most beautiful. So we have the world's media eyes trained on Cornwall, um, and that, and the Carbis Bay Hotel. All right. So Carbis Bay is your hero of the week. Yeah. I, I think what an amazing, amazing thing to pull off i was down there last week and we were just seeing all the signs go up on the roads uh, and no doubt there are you know a lot of locals will <laughs> it will be causing a, a a lot of difficulty um but i think it you know it, at a time like now having ha having cornwall being beamed uh, by the media into so many countries around the world can only be a good thing Good luck to everybody involved in that. It's a, it is a massive undertaking. It's a massive undertaking, yeah. Cornwall probably never see anything like it again, but uh, good, <laughs> good luck to everybody uh, involved in that. And who or what are you telling to get in the bin, Kerry? Oh, mine's a bit, I mean, my get in the bin, I did not want to be political, so... <laughs> no, everybody else is. <laughs> I know, but um, I'm not. Um, mine is a bit uh, light-hearted, I guess. I'm not going to be political. I think we've all heard enough about various uh, politicians here and in the States over the last few years. But mine is really all the critics of the Friends reunion. Um, I'm a massive Friends fan. And I was in LA at the filming of the very last episode. Um, and just seeing 
as a production, those cast members come together, you know, 17 years on and still having that connection, both with each other and with the fans of the show, um, was sort of a walk down memory lane. And so people took it really seriously. The Guardian had a, an article claiming what a disgrace it was. But, you know, I thought it was fun. It was nice. And it was great to see how a production like that can stand the test of time, connect to so many ages and audience around the world. And we're still all tuning in wherever we were. I mean, I have to say, I mean, I'm not a huge Friends fan, but my my 11-year-old daughter is a massive Friends fan. She She watches nothing else. So that meant I sat through the whole show and watched it. And actually, you know what, as a piece of TV in terms of the, the, the guys at Full Well that put the show together, it was a really compelling view. And it was, you know, it was a couple of hours long, I think. So it kept me watching till the end anyway. It was. And I hope I've aged as well in the 17 years. And I think all of the, the, all the, all the cast did, rather. Yeah, no, it was, it was a good piece of TV, let's, let's say. And, you know, obviously it was meant to be the big launch for HBO Max as well, but it was uh, m- much delayed uh, piece of TV. Kerry, Adam, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really enjoyed hearing more about Stroom and also Smart, the London International Smartphone Film Festival. It was uh, great to have you both on the show. Really enjoyed chatting to you. All the best with uh, your various businesses. Thank you so much. Thanks very much for having me. I've really enjoyed the conversation and... Um, I really like the program. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great thing to listen to when you're going for a run. Uh, passes the time very happily. Well, that's about it for another week's show. As always, thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to Telecast and share it with friends and colleagues. And a quick reminder to sign up for our free newsletter called Telecast Plus. It's packed with interesting TV industry stories of the week you may have missed downloadable reports and surveys, and exclusive insight and opinion. And it's all completely free. Just visit our website to sign up at telecast-podcast.com. That's telecast-podcast.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in London. Until next Thursday... As always, stay safe. Thanks for listening to another Telecast. A quick reminder to sign up for our free weekly newsletter, Telecast Plus. It features interesting TV news stories from a different angle and exclusive content, such as Opinion and The Secret Producer, our anonymous TV exec reporting from the front line of TV production. Plus, we're bumping up the goodies with more free downloads of TV industry reports, discounts and exclusive access to some live telecast events we're planning for the months ahead. And you'll only get access to those if you're on our mailing list. And don't worry, we don't like spam either, so we won't do anything weird with your data like sell it on to advertisers or anything. Just sign up at our website by searching Telecast on Google or visiting telecast-podcast.com. Thanks a lot.